Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Adam Lane Smith, the attachment specialist here. Have you ever struggled in a romantic relationship? Has it maybe been hard to bond? You're not gonna be surprised to know that four separate studies over the last 25 years have confirmed that about 50% of adult Americans now struggle to bond in romantic relationships. Now this gets worse the younger the generations are. So if you're in your 20s, it's probably a higher rate. It could actually be more like two thirds of the research is indicating. If you're in a relationship right now, that means that there's at least a 50-50 chance that one of you has this issue. In fact, if one of you has the problem, then it's likely that both of you have the problem because people with attachment issues tend to pair up. You've learned this from my other videos. People with attachment issues seek out each other. It's just a known fact. So the one most likely to seek out knowledge about problems is the more anxiously attached of the two people. So welcome to the channel, Anxiously Attached People. <laughs> I am here to help. Today, we're going to be talking about couples. As you know, I'm Adam Lane Smith, the attachment specialist. I worked for years as a licensed marriage and family therapist, helping couples through their issues. But what I found was that attachment issues were almost always at the heart of romantic problems. So I retired that license so I could coach internationally. Now I help individuals and couples all over the world. And I focus into attachment because I believe it is the core problem for everything else that we're experiencing. Attachment theory says that when you are little, you learn a skill set and a mindset for connecting with your caregivers to get your needs met and to feel loved and to feel safe, right? Sharing your needs, sharing issues, getting help in return. We learn this skill set as children. It's a behavior thing. It's not just programmed into you at birth, right? You are looking for it. You're trying to understand how your environment will work with you and what the people will do in your environment. Now, when this gets broken, it can drive huge problems like not being able to ask for your needs to get met, not knowing if other people will ever be fair with you. That's more of an avoidant thing. Believing that you don't deserve love or there's something wrong with you on the inside so you can't open up to other people because you'll be a burden. That's more of an anxiously attached kind of thing. But fixing these attachment problems also helps you stay bonded for life. I've seen couples who are anxious and avoidant, one of each, and they fix it. And it's like, the best way to describe it is it's like finding their first true love ever, because it's the first person who ever made them feel safe and consistently loved in a way that they've been craving their entire life. Remember that when you go back to that core child bonding problem, when you fix that, that's everything you've ever wanted. You just didn't realize that it was possible to get it. So when you can get that together as a couple, it bonds you to an extreme level in a good way so that you stay together for life in a loving relationship. So the goal of this video is to provide answers in a way that you can easily easily share with a partner to fix those frustrations that you're probably both experiencing. Okay. You may have come in on my how to love an avoidant man video. You may have come in on signs that you have anxious attachment. I do have how to love an anxious person on my channel as well. So whichever partner you are more likely to come in as an anxious person because they're desperately craving answers. Whereas avoidant people tend to believe that this just is the way the world works. It's just what I've seen in, in my years of clinical experience. If you're here, I'm ready to help. And I'm going to show you through this video exactly how to build a loving relationship. So heads up, if your partner is showing this video and if they're staring at you on the couch, looking back and forth at you right now, okay? If you feel like you're walking into a firing squad, this is not about demonizing anyone. It is not about making you feel like you are a problem, okay? I want to show you how bonding gets disrupted just in general and lay out some options that should feel comfortable for everyone. Remember that a good, successful romantic relationship is not one where either person feels strong-armed or muscled into the situation. Both have to feel comfortable and fulfilled for this relationship to really be successful long-term. That's what I'm gonna show you here today. So if somebody is showing you this video, I hope, and this should be, the start of an important conversation about how you can care for each other differently. And I'm gonna make that really, really simple to implement, okay? Let's go. So a moment ago, I touched on attachment theory. You're going to have to know attachment theory. And if somebody's showing you this video for the first time, you're going to need to know this really quick. Briefly, 
attachment theory says this. As kids, we learn that skill set and that mindset to get our needs met with other people, either working openly, transparently with them to talk about our needs, talk about challenges, and then resolve it like a utopian experience. It's just secure attachment. That's what our brains are looking for. That's secure attachment, right? And then you have high confidence in yourself and in others, and you look for transparency and openness to build relationships. These people... <laughs> They seem boring on the outside because they bond slower, but they bond so much deeper. And for sustainable, lifelong relationships, they're more likely to walk away from really bad situations because they just know that better is around the corner. They don't dismiss other people. They're actually very kind and compassionate. They just have lower urgency to maintain one relationship at all costs because they know that so much better is out there. They've experienced it. Secure attachment, okay? If you don't have that growing up, there could be a number of things that go wrong. Maybe you were a baby who got put in the hospital for three weeks and you cried and cried and cried and learned no one will ever comfort you. So your brain has switched into a survival mode. I've seen that happen even in wonderful families. Maybe you were adopted. Maybe you have a trauma. Maybe your parents divorced and then you, you learn that families don't stay together and love doesn't really matter. Maybe one parent was anxious and they were always scared and so you had to caretake them. Maybe one person was, one parent was avoidant. So the, you had to constantly crave their approval. Maybe your parents screamed at each other all the time. So you learned to just stay away from other people because they're not trustworthy. There can be a number of issues that go wrong. And it doesn't mean you have a bad family. But when that breaks, what your brain does is clicks into the survival mode, right? Low oxytocin, low GABA, gamma aminobutyric acid, low vasopressin, low serotonin. And it focuses mostly on survival and getting dopamine to cope with the stress. So cortisol and dopamine are the two main chemicals you'll be looking at. You can break in a number of ways. Number one is anxious attachment, where you internalize the blame for everything that happened in your environment. Something is wrong with me that other people don't love me. I am unacceptable. I am a fraud. I am awful. People will see this thing in me and leave me. So I have to keep myself quiet, be a perfect, happy cardboard cutout all the time. And never do anything wrong or create a burden to anybody. Someone who do 10 nice things for them and hopefully they will read my mind and do what I want in return. Now, this person, this anxious attachment person is also desperately afraid of abandonment at all times. Abandonment feels like death to them. Their brain, when they were two years old, logged abandonment and death together. So they try to avoid caretaking abandonment as a child so they don't die alone in the forest at two years old is what your brain's thinking. But then that carries into their adult life. Avoidantly attached people, if you're watching this, these are the people who you can't get time away from. They are constantly craving your approval. They are constantly doing nice things for you, seemingly with no strings attached, but then getting resentful later. I've seen this tear relationships apart in the long term, and it can be exhausting. Anxiously attached people, that's not me saying that you're bad people, but those behaviors are exhausting to yourself and to your partner. That's one reason that we have to fix that. That's why anxious attachment is not sustainable in a long-term relationship. You can also break the other way. Avoidant attachment says nobody else on earth is ever going to be fair with me or each other. When people get stressed out, they act badly, terribly, okay? When other people have moral choices, they do not choose morality. Other people are not self-policing. They will do what is most convenient for them, especially when they're stressed out. Therefore, I can never be in anybody else's control and I can never solve problems with other people. I have to solve everything alone. So everything becomes performative. Try to fluff other people's feelings so that they will generally leave you alone and maybe meet your needs. Relationships become more of an exchange of good feelings. I gave you good feelings. Hopefully you give me good feelings in return. You gave me bad feelings. I'm going to put up a wall. Okay. Avoidantly attached people, they get demonized all over the internet for being like these horrible monsters. And you know what? There are some of them who are manipulative and hurtful, but the vast majority, through my experience, 15 years of training experience now, my master's degree in psychology, all my thousands of clients I've helped through the years, most avoidant people are just afraid of getting trapped. They are afraid of unfair expectations and they're afraid of getting hurt. So they avoid conflict, especially and intimacy where they feel like they will get hurt and trapped and exploited by other people. That's what they're avoiding. But they also don't believe they can just ask for things like space. Hey, I need some space. It's okay. It's not you. It's me. I really just need to step out for a minute. I will come back in four hours. It's totally cool. This is a great way for you to love me. They can't do that. So they accidentally set off the anxious person by like dive rolling out the window. Hey, what's that? Whoa, leap out the window. And the anxious person goes, no, why are you leaving me? And leaps out the window after you with like a bear trap open to snap on you, right? 
like this is this is the dance of anxious and avoidant. There's also the blend of the two, disorganized, where you are one on the outside, but then that's protecting you from once people get to the inside, you flip. I am anxious on the outside and approval seeking and craving, but once I actually connect to people, whoa, I put up the wall and I escape and I run away. Very chaotic. Or I'm avoidant on the outside and never let anyone in because the moment somebody does get in, I flip to anxious and approval seeking and I'm terrified they're going to abandon me. Much more chaotic, very, very chaotic. The research shows maybe 2 to 5% of the population has disorganized, about 25% of the population has avoidant, and about 20% has anxious. Okay, avoidant people are actually more common than anxious people. If you're watching this video, and it seems like it would be easier to have somebody guide you through this, a mentor to show you exactly what to do step by step in applying everything you're learning here, you need to join the Attachment Circle Mentorship Program. I will work with you personally for an entire year in 100 plus group calls. Plus, you're going to get the support of a growth-minded community of other individuals who will be companions on your journey, people you can trust, people you can work with, and people you can practice these skills with. If you want to join us, join the Attachment Circle mentorship program. There's a link below in the description. I'll see you in there. Now, the goal of secure attachment, you guys, the goal of getting to secure attachment is to stop this dance where you can't ask for your needs to get met, where you are afraid of being abandoned, where you're afraid of getting trapped so that you can just calmly, if you're avoidant, go to your partner and say, hey, um, I am really emotionally exhausted from my week. Uh, it's not you. I, I, I'm just at capacity. I, I have nothing left to give right now. I really need about 12 hours to just reset. I need to be by myself. I need to go lock myself in a room, play some video games or read or just go for a walk. I, I just need to be away from humans. Can you give this to me as my partner so that I can feel better? That would be an avoidant person being able to do that. The anxious person being able to say, yeah, absolutely. You need time? Cool. I get that it's not about me. Please go take your rest. If at 12 hours it's not enough, let me know. I'll give you more. It's also the anxious person being able to think, hmm, have I done something wrong? They haven't texted me back in three hours. Did I do something that made them upset? And you go, no, I've done nothing. We have clearly defined issues of what would cause a problem, so I have no reason to be afraid. They're probably just out doing something. I'll hear from them later. It's that comfort level of being able to just calmly soothe yourself. It's also when a problem pops up, being able to go to your partner and say, hey, you probably had no idea this was an issue. Can we just resolve it really fast? Get it out of the way so that we can get back to just hugging and making out, right? Here's this problem. You left their shoes in this hallway. We've talked about that before. I just kind of want to work on this with you. Do we need a shoe basket? Do we need something like that to make this easier for you? Hey, you know what? I'm going to have a really awful week and I might, I'm going to try really not, not to be grumpy this week, but if I am, I am really sorry. Please just let me know in advance. And the other person says, oh, you're going to have a bad week. Cool. What can I do to help? How can I assist you, right? I can't do your work for you. Do you need me to meal prep for you? Do you need me to be here for you in the evening so that we can decompress by watching The Witcher together on Netflix? Or do you need me to like clear out and leave you alone this week so that you have every night yourself? What do you need from me so I can help you succeed this week? It's that level of com comfortable back and forth with your partner sharing needs that you could have learned as a child that your parents, when you said, mom and dad, I'm having a really rough week, they'd say, okay, how can we help you succeed? Instead of, well, you better do this and this and this, or just being like, whatever kid, bye. Or just not being there because they live across the country and they never speak to you, right? All of these issues roll in together. But once you learn secure attachment, you can get your needs met like that. And not only with a partner, but with friends, with family, with personal relationships, with professional relationships. This video focuses on couples, okay? But what I want to lay home for you and, and really hit home for you is that secure attachment improves the quality of your life everywhere you go. Also in your romantic life, though, especially in your romantic life. If you want to succeed as a couple, if you want a relationship, a marriage that lasts for 50 plus years, if you want to be that old couple sitting in the rocking chairs on the front porch together, you must learn secure attachment, okay? So let's get into what that looks like. Now, guys, I have devoted my life to studying attachment theory and it's practical, practical applications. This is not academic for me. This is not just research in an ivory tower. This is what does it mean and what can we do about it? Okay. So this video here is a basic overview to get you exactly what you need as a couple. If you want more information, I've got a ton on this channel. Go check out other videos like my hour-long dissection of the seven signs of anxious attachment style. That can be really helpful for people who aren't sure if that's what they're dealing with. But for right now, here's what you need to know about how attachment issues 
are probably driving the challenges in your relationship right now. Number one, challenges of anxious and avoidant dynamics. So number one, anxious partners. Are you constantly, constantly having the need to address your fears where you are always afraid? You have fear spikes. I call them fear spikes, anxious spikes, where your emotional brain on the right side goes way off the chart. And you suddenly start ruminating on what if that's true? What if they don't love me anymore? They haven't texted me in four minutes, right? If you're having that fear spike, okay? If you constantly need reassurance more than you even want, but you're constantly needing to know that the other person doesn't hate you. This is something called emotional impermanence. There's something called object impermanence that babies have where if something goes away and disappears, they don't see it, they forget that it exists, but then it comes back and they go, whoa, it's still there. That's object impermanence and a baby's brain has to learn that that exists. Anxiously attached people have something called emotional impermanence. The moment someone's feelings for you aren't right in your face, you forget that they have those feelings and that feeling starts to die and you start to believe their feelings for you are dying as well. Okay. Anxious people will have the tendency to cling. They'll have the tendency to hold on. They'll have the tendency to take things personally. They'll have the tendency to need a lot more than they even want because they're trying to soothe that cortisol pathway in their brain. They're trying to end the cortisol and stress, the fear of abandonment, the fear of not being loved, the fear of being exposed as a fraud. Okay. If you're experiencing that big sign that there's an anxious person in your relationship, maybe you avoidant partners. If you feel an overwhelming need for independence, more than you can even really justify, you just need to get away. If it feels like your leg is caught in a trap, if you have emotional distance between you and other people, and you've been told that you come across as maybe being aloof or cold, maybe not arrogant, maybe other people might perceive you as arrogant. You probably are not. Most avoidant people are not arrogant, but maybe you come across that way. Maybe it's hard to approach you. Maybe you just keep everything at surface level. Maybe you have the reflex to withdraw when you have a conflict coming up. You pull away and it's lone wolf survival time. Really big indicators that there's avoidant attachment happening in one of the partners. Again, maybe you, or maybe your partner is staring at you right now on the couch saying, this is you silently in their head over and over. That's also possible, but it, this is a survival behavior that is not something wrong with you. It's a survival mode that typically has clicked on. Now, again, this is a cycle of frustration that builds into a push and pull dynamic that strains the relationship. I need space. Well, I need care and reassurance. Well, I need to breathe. Well, no, you don't. Well, I need this. Well, I need this. And it's constant back and forth, usually with the avoidant partner trying desperately to give good feelings to the other partner. But then that tapers off as they get very little reassurance or comfort in return into the, what they're looking for. So they start with what anxious people call breadcrumbing, right? You're giving me less and less love and I'm chasing you. Well, stop chasing me, right? That's that frustration cycle. Understanding this frustration cycle is incredibly important. Now it should lead to the next question. What do I do about this? Great question. I'm going to show you the four opening steps. That helps my couples, co my coaching clients when they come in to find successful romance together. Okay. Four things that I recommend all of my couples do that really does lead to long-term success. That takes you from frustrated into content, happy, fulfilled really enjoying your relationship together, a relationship that refreshes you instead of draining you, both of you. Okay. Number one, the first thing that I recommend my couples do is self-awareness. I encourage both partners to recognize your own attachment styles and triggers. Again, this is not about labeling you. My, my anxiously attached people crave to be labeled. So they finally have an explanation that's outside of themselves. I'm not evil. It's this thing, right? But avoidantly attached people really resent being labeled and told you're wrong. This is something wrong with you. And, and that's not what this is. It, it, it's that skill set and that mindset from a survival adaptation is just creating a brain chemistry difference and a bonding difference. That's all it is. So this is one way of being. There is another way of being that can be more fulfilling for you if you choose to go there. But gaining awareness of your own behaviors and your limits and your triggers and what bothers you and how you might want to change and find more fulfillment. Gaining that awareness is step number one. You have to have that. That's half of the battle, frankly, for avoidantly attached people is just getting them to even understand that there is 
another layer of bonding that they can step into that's more fulfilling. Now, step number two is learning better communication strategies. This can be stuff like I shared a little bit earlier. Hey, you know what? I am exhausted from my week and I really need some time to myself to recharge. It's not about you at all. I really need this. That is a great way to disarm an anxiously attached person instead of saying, hey, uh, I'm going to need to take some time. I'm not going to speak to you for 12 hours and I'll talk to you you know, next week. <laughs> they say, what? Wait. And you've already shut off your phone. Not good. Even if you're exhausted. There are ways to use communication strategies that are not draining. Uh, anxiously attached people, I encourage you when there's a problem to go to your avoidantly attached person and state right up front what your goal is instead of trying to say, we need to talk, we have this problem, here's this. You go up and say, hey, you know what? Um, I want us to have a wonderful, amazing relationship. We're almost there, but there's just one problem right now that I want us to get through really quick. If we can take 10 minutes, we'll get through it. I just want to hear from you and we'll build a solution together and then it's done and we'll go on with our day. Much easier for an avoidant person to take that in. They might still bristle a little bit, but they hear what you're trying to achieve and they hear that you're going to be fair with them. I encourage most of my anxiously attached clients to make sure you use the word fair. I want us to find a solution that is fair for both of us and then assess at every step and ask them again, do you feel that this is fair to you? Is it realistically, is this fair to you? And if not, how can we build a more fair solution? When you start using that language and, and authentically meaning it and backing it up, avoidant people, they're shocked. They're often shocked that somebody is diligent in fairness, that somebody's being just with them. It's surprising to them. Remember that the core of avoidance is that belief that nobody will ever be fair with them. So the more that you can use that in your communication, the better. If you're watching this video and it seems like it would be easier to have somebody guide you through this, a mentor to show you exactly what to do step by step and applying everything you're learning here, you need to join the Attachment Circle Mentorship Program. I will work with you personally for an entire year in 100 plus group calls. Plus, you're going to get the support of a growth minded community of other individuals who will be companions on your journey, people you can trust, people you can work with, and people you can practice these skills with. If you want to join us, join the Attachment Circle Mentorship mentorship program. There's a link below in the description. I'll see you in there. Step number three that I work on with my coaching clients and that I'm encouraging you to explore is emotional regulation. Now, it sounds like this is mostly going to be on the anxious people. Look, manage your own feelings, manage your anxiety. And I certainly do teach most of my anxious clients some physical grounding techniques, ways to manage those emotional spikes, things that I've worked on that help with panic attacks, help with issues like that. There's a tremendous number of skills that you can learn to regulate. And yes, anxiously attached people, you get a bad rap for being the emotional ones, but avoidantly attached people on the inside are very emotional. Still waters run deep, as the saying goes, and avoidantly attached people usually have very deep anxieties that they experience as well. A lot of avoidantly attached people have lived their entire life with anxiety, that high cortisol, low oxytocin, low GABA, low vasopressin, low serotonin, so they don't recognize that their anxiety levels are way up there. Many of them might chart themselves down at 2 out of 10 anxiety, when in fact what you're probably experiencing daily is 7 out of 10. It's just that you've never been able to relax low enough. So emotional regulation and managing that during a conflict, especially absolutely crucial. Learn that together as a couple. The fourth step that is absolutely mandatory for couples who are looking to build secure attachment is to meet each other's needs. And to do this, you have to be able to discuss and express and negotiate those needs in a measurable way that makes sense to the other person, what you are wanting and why and how often. You also have to discuss the boundaries that are in those relationships that might break you up, that might make you angry, what you need, all of that in ways that respect both partners' attachment styles. So you don't show up with a rolled up parchment and unroll it five, 10 feet across the floor with a lengthy list of needs they have not met and start dictating what's going to happen. This is what often happens in year 10 or year 15 of a relationship with the anxious attachment person becoming very angry and resentful at all these secret needs that have never been met for years. And the avoidant person saying, why did you never tell me this? Very, very common for this to happen. But it's also common for the avoidant person to never mention these needs at all, which is why avoidant people are more likely to go out and have an affair. And then relationships and couples usually only begin fixing the process once that pain has been initiated because somebody didn't have a met need. 
Very, very common. I work with that all the time. I've seen it so many times. Yes, you can come back from all of those, by the way. It's just better to do it now before the problems really hit, okay? These four steps that I've laid out here, they are a great foundation for building more secure attachment, but you also need a few steps to reduce the negative impact of those attachment issues that we've been talking about. So here's what works for each style, as well as some encouragement, hopefully, so that each of you can really lean into this work together. So some practical tips. Number one, self-soothing techniques. There are some specific ways of managing anxiety and reducing dependence on the avoidant partner for your reassurance. I'm speaking to the anxiously attached people here. Learning to manage your own anxiety is incredibly important if you want a long-term successful relationship. Don't worry, I'm not just blaming you right now. I will get to the avoidant person. I'll blame you too here in a minute. But really lean into this idea that you need to manage your own emotion, okay? You need to manage those feelings. Feelings are just sensory data. Feelings are your sixth sense. They are telling you things about your world. It is more likely right now that your sensors are tuned incorrectly. So they're detecting threats everywhere. You are not a slave to your emotions. Your emotions should bring you information that you as a cognitive being use in your decision process. Learning to manage those feelings and put them where they belong and then make intelligent, reasoned decisions on your own, very important. I can teach you that in coaching. Therapy can teach you that. There's a number of physical grounding techniques. Physical techniques are more effective, I have found, than anything else. So lean into some physical self-soothing techniques. That's my best advice right there. For avoidant people, understanding the importance of your own need for space and independence. But being able to get that need met without terrifying your anxious partner, okay? You have needs. You are exhausted. You are run down. You need to get away from other people. Being around other people feels performative and exhausting. I get that, okay? You also need to be able to get that need met, but in a way that's not going to scare your partner. This is not about walking on eggshells. You should never walk on eggshells in a relationship either side, But it is about you learning how to articulate to your anxious partner what you need and then pitching it to them as a way of loving you. That's what I've seen work most often is when you say, this is what I need. I need this space. Here's why. Here's how it will help me feel. This is the best way you can give me love. Then the anxious person craves to give you space, which is fascinating. It's fascinating. They'll flip that switch because what they really want to do is give you love and receive love and form reciprocal love, but they don't know how. Learning to share your needs in that way, incredibly important for avoidantly attached people. Learning that somebody even cares what your needs are and really believing that and testing that with your partner, incredibly crucial that you be able to do that, okay? And number three, positive reinforcement for both of you. Notice and appreciate the efforts that both people are putting in, okay? Anxiously attached people, praise the avoidant people when they open up to you and let them know why it's important and how it feels, and why it means something to you. Most avoidant people are blown away at the idea that somebody would actually like that they're opening up to them about problems. Most avoidant people think other people will treat them like a burden. They are stunned to hear that somebody wants to hear from them. And that's awfully sad. But that's something that you out there can give to your avoidant partner. Avoidant partners. When your anxious person soothes themselves... Okay, or when they share something that's scary, praise them. I mean, they crave it. It's almost like, what what do they call it? A praise kink. Anxious people have a praise kink. Give them that praise when you actually see them doing those things that are self-reliant. Really great way to reinforce that self-reliance. And praise them for their character more than you praise them for things that they've done for you, for example. That's what their parents usually did growing up was praise them for things that they did for them. Praise them for the strength of their character and the reliability of their character. Very, very important. Now, I will say this. The next piece, it's going to be hard. It's going to be hard for you guys to hear, but it's very important, okay? Showing vulnerability is the number one of all of these things, the biggest step toward growth and healing in your relationship is showing vulnerability to each other. It's a powerful step that's absolutely vital that you be able to initiate, show vulnerability. That could be sharing this video. I recommend sharing this video with your partner. Use this as a conversation starter though. 
It's an invitation to work together toward a more secure and fulfilling relationship, okay? That's what you're looking for is a secure, fulfilling relationship for both sides. Share this video, but don't just watch it and then slink off into different rooms and avoid eye contact. Have a conversation after this video. Turn this video off after this and talk about it. Talk about what the number one takeaway was for you and the number one thing you want to implement from this video into your relationship, each of you. If you're here right now, after having somebody share this with you, this can be the start of a very important conversation about what you need to feel comfortable in this relationship. So guys, all of you, please lean into that talk and have that conversation as a couple. That's what I want you to take from this video here today. I cannot, I cannot overstate the importance of leaning towards secure attachment and building secure attachment as a couple. Okay. If you are trapped in an anxious and avoidant dynamic, either side, you're not going to be happy for very long. If you're happy right now, trust me, it won't last. I literally wrote the book on this problem over my shoulder. Exhausted wives, bewildered husbands. Why relationships crack apart at 20 years? It's anxious and avoidant dynamics built up into a spiral of misery for 20 years that destroys your family. So even if you manage to hold on for a while, you will eventually collapse. Fix it now. Fix it now. Whether you're happy and you're in your first six months or you're at year five, fix it right now. And if you guys are struggling with this, right? Hire a professional. I, for example, am here to help coach you through this process. I have what I call my marriage rescue coaching package. We do eight sessions together. I help you fix your attachment and I teach you all those skills that you never learned as kids to communicate, to bond, to connect with your partner in a way that is sustainable for life. You guys need help? Drop in the comments, let me know, shoot me an email, support at adamlanesmith.com is the best email for me. Get connected. I've also got the Attachment Bootcamp video course to help you take immediate steps right now. All of that is available on my website, adamlanesmith.com. You can fix your attachment together as a couple through a quick video course that runs you through exactly what to do as a couple. If this one video was helpful, imagine hours and hours and hours of clear guidance with exact steps. That's what'll help. So if the steps in this video sound intimidating, I'm here to assist in a number of ways, you guys. Reach out in the comments, reach out in my email. I am here, let's talk. It's been great getting to know you. I'm Adam Lane Smith, the attachment specialist. If you got blindsided with this video, <laughs> welcome to the channel. Glad that you are here. Go check out the next video that's been extremely helpful for couples, how to love an avoidant man. That'll start a conversation.